loading. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Stargazing and Explore the Universe. So um, it's a wonderful universe out there. And uh, just to reassure everyone uh, that uh, you don't need to uh, have uh, seen any of the previous sessions that we've had here. We, we tend to try and keep this as a like a carousel where you can join us at any time and leave any time and just pick up where you left off. Uh, and it'll be just a different sky out there. So we're going to be pointing out uh, stars. Um, not so much planets this time, um, although uh, Jeff uh, Robertson will be talking about that. And we'll have a, a little bit on uh, the moon and star clusters and um, also uh, movement, uh, things that happen in the sky, the patterns and cycles. So our original plan was to meet at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, which hopefully we'll get back to doing in person uh, this September. And the idea is just to uh, talk a little bit and then step outside and look at the, the sky, hopefully clear. And uh, if you've got a telescope that you're having challenges with, you can uh, help you uh, set it up and get going. So that's the original idea. And um, the other thing about this is these sessions are about uh, using your eyes, sometimes with binoculars, but what can you see? Stars, planets, uh, the uh, noctilucent clouds, aurora, and comets, and uh, just really look up. That's uh, the, the whole idea, and uh, I always reassure people uh, uh, that uh, the best way to learn the sky is to get outside at every clear opportunity, if only for five minutes, just to refresh uh, yourself as to the names of the brightest stars. Um, we're doing this under the umbrella of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And uh, if you follow along, uh, we uh, encourage you to uh, print out the Explore the Universe uh, booklet, uh, PDF, and uh, by uh, sort of filling it out and uh, looking at the sky afterwards, so you should be able to earn yourself a, a free pin and certificate from the RASC. And, uh, for uh, if you click on the main link uh, that leads you to uh, the topic uh, here, we uh, you'll see a link for Explore the Universe uh, certificate. It's uh, fairly straightforward. It's just uh, a list of, uh, it's just a handful of pages and gives you an idea of uh, what uh, you need to uh, look at. Uh, the names of some of the brighter stars, and uh, hopefully you note down a, uh, a few things uh, that uh, that you see. So really, that simple. So just to put you at your ease, uh, despite the name Royal. Astronomical Society of Canada. It sounds like a really big thing. Most of us are just uh, ordinary folk who have an interest in the sky. Uh, but we uh, have a lot of uh, subgroups that uh, where you can learn more and more about things uh, from, uh, from Explore the Moon and to Exploring Galaxies and other sorts of gas clouds, as well as a little bit of uh, asteroid if you're so inclined. So we do a lot of things, uh, but especially a good camaraderie uh, with uh, the folks here. And uh, we do a bunch of things. You can come join us out at our dark nights. And uh, we also publish various things like Sky News uh, as a part of your membership, as is the Observer's Handbook. So with that bit of promo out of the way. Move on to tonight. Pause, pause, pause. There we go. So tonight uh, we'll be looking uh, at the winter sky, the moon, uh, Berta will 
be talking as well about solar observing and double stars, and then we'll wrap things up about our tilted sky that we work with. First, as usual, we uh, talk a little about things that move in the sky, like the International Space Station, the brightest of all the artificial satellites uh, that are up in the sky. They uh, tend to move across the sky uh, with a similar rate that a plane appears to move, but the space station is actually going a lot faster than a plane, and, but that's because it's a lot farther away. The two effects kind of cancel out, and so it looks like it's about moving across the sky with a, with a, a plane. Uh, there aren't many evening passes at all. We're running uh, through the end of it. Uh, we probably won't see tonight with the advancing cloud. And, uh, but maybe uh, over the next night or two, we'll uh, be able to get uh, uh, some in looking uh, towards the southwest uh, just after nine o'clock. And then it reappears in the morning sky uh, later in April. Okay, the sky. Um, the, uh, the, this is a chart of the sky, um, and if you hold it above your head, the middle of the chart is straight overhead in the sky. Uh, but if you're looking uh, south, uh, you, you want to put the S at the bottom of the chart. And uh, what you will see is the departing winter constellations. And it's already um, getting later and later, and it'll in next month, it will be uh, cresting on 11 o'clock before it gets dark enough uh, to see the stars. But for the moment, uh, we have uh, our departing winter sky and the wonderful set of bright uh, stars that we have, uh, Capella, Castor and Pollux, Procyon, and the uh, marvelous blue-white star Sirius, and the very noticeable Orion constellation with its three belt stars that point down to Sirius. Um, and uh, it's a pity, well, um, oh yeah, it's tomorrow night, there's a pass of the International Space Station, and it looks like it'll go right through the Orion Nebula from uh, where we are at uh, uh, just after um, 20 past nine. So that uh, might be interesting. So uh, you can use your binoculars and uh, you'll see a little fuzzy um, blob where the Orion Nebula is. Uh, but uh, tonight we're uh, going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Big Dipper and uh, Arcturus. But halfway there is the uh, bright blue-white star Regulus from Leo the Lion. But, so when we look east, you turn the chart sideways so that east is down at the bottom. So again, uh, up high right is uh, the middle of the chart. But when you look east, Regulus will be off to your right. Arcturus will now be almost um, straight east. It'll only be a little later in the evening. It'll rotate up because uh, the, the sky appears to rotate around Polaris. And of course, we find the Big Dipper standing on its tail in spring and uh, the nice double star in the crook of the handle here, Alcorn Mizar. So uh, as I, um, if I remember uh, to say it, um, th there's only really about uh, 20 to 30 star names that you, you ever really need to know uh, for, uh, especially for uh, finding your way around the sky. Um, of course, uh, most of these, like you know, even this guy here at the end of the Little Dipper uh, has a name, and, and of course, all of the stars of the Big Dipper uh, have a name as well, but um, they're, they're not quite as easy to remember. You don't have to remember all of them, but uh, certainly Alcorn Mizar are wonderful in binoculars and small telescopes. So that's a good one to remember the name of. And uh, Arcturus, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second here. And one of the easiest things uh, in the sky to remember as your, your sort of first signpost, if you're a brand new to looking at the sky, uh, well, most of us can find the Big Dipper. It's, it's going to be quite high in the sky. And then you see the, the curve of the handle sort of leads you right to Arcturus. And so um, we've, uh, just about all of us have started with the 
saying arc to arcturus as a, a way of remembering that that star name is arcturus so if you go out every a few nights and look at that uh, arc in the dipper's handle, arc to Arcturus, and then pretty soon you'll never forget that that star is called Arcturus. So it's uh, the fourth uh, brightest star in the sky. Uh, it only just ekes out uh, summer's Vega, uh, but uh, it, it uh, definitely is um, uh, out there. Uh, one of the, it is modestly close and it's a star in its uh, senior years. It's finished its uh, main uh, fusing of hydrogen into helium as our sun. That's what powers our, uh, our star, the sun. Uh, but um, our sun in its later golden age will uh, uh, inflate up, swallow us, um, in about five billion years or so, um, as it um, begins uh, fusing uh, helium into carbon. You don't have to worry about that. Um, I like to draw on uh, some of uh, the other uh, mythologies out there, um, in, in addition to uh, the standard sort of Greek, Greco Roman mythologies, and from the uh, Dakota. Uh, uh, indigenous uh, folks, uh, they called it uh, the stretcher, um, where uh, you have uh, in the bowl of the, the dipper is where the deceased are, and the handle are the, uh, the mourners who are holding uh, the stretcher and pulling uh, the deceased. Uh, in uh, further north, in the, uh, up in the Arctic Circle, um, Arcturus is known as Sivuli'ik, sorry about the pronunciation there, and uh, which roughly translates as the ones who walk in front. And so what are they in front of? Well, a little further on to the sort of lower left or later on at night, uh, the Milky Way will be rising along with the bright star Vega and uh, the nice uh, summer sky. So um, uh, they are known as the ones that will be leading into uh, those uh, part of the sky. And over to Berta. So hello everyone, good night. Um, as Alistair has mentioned, uh, we prepare these presentations following the Explore the Universe certificate um, list. Um, so the first items in the list are the constellations, which Alistair just uh, mentioned. So there are constellations for every season of the year for you to look at. Um, and then the next, the second uh, list uh, in the Explore the Universe is the moon, um, which you should become familiar with its movements, its cycles and features on the surface of the moon. So today we are gonna highlight two features, one uh, lunar basin and Mari, uh, so those are the big uh, darker areas in the sky, in the moon. And then later on, we will talk about one crater. Um, so the, the, the lunar basin that uh, we have uh, today is the Sinus Iridum. So is that, thank you, Alistair, is that um, beautiful, area of the moon. And this picture doesn't actually, uh, maybe I didn't choose the best picture because later on I will have a, a, I have another picture where you can see Sinus Iridun is around 260 kilometers across. Uh, it's a flooded partial crater and extends into Mare Imbrun, which is the biggest, uh, yeah, thank you, Alistair. So that's, that's Mare Imbrun, but Sinus Iridun is just a little bay of that, that sea. Um, and that bay is surrounded by a very beautiful area to look at, which is the Montes Jura. Uh, they don't look very good in this picture, but um, later on I will show you. And if you look at it, uh, when the terminator, when the separation between the day and the night in the moon is happening, when it goes across the Sinus Iridum, you can it highlights all the features of the uh, of the of the objects around that terminator and you can really clearly see those those high mountains so if you look at 
the moon on the around the 11th day of the cycle and we count the cycle started at the new moon so the new moon is day zero and then the day after the new moon is day one and the day after that is day two right alistair am i getting it right uh thank you uh so so then you get um then when you get to day 11 look uh past first quarter so way past first quarter you get to see the the sorry you get to see the sinusiridon and you can actually see it a little bit better in this picture you can see the montes jura up there um so so there is there is uh, these features a little bit in there so there is a, a lot of topology in that area of the moon and it's, it's something that you can see with binoculars and then the next thing that we are going to talk about in the moon is the copernicus crater it's actually you can see it is another crater that is best best seen between the nine, nine and ten days all of the moon so a little bit past first quarter um, and it's an, a spectacular crater with 3260 meters deep walls so it's three kilometers high or deep uh, whatever you want to think it and um, it also features prominent rays that can be seen at near or full moon so when the terminator again alistair if you can um so when the terminator which is the area between the day and the night when the terminator is close to the to this crater uh you can actually see um just the crater with a lot of detail and you can see based on the depth of the shadow how tall or how deep that crater is and uh because the shadow is so deep it means that it's a deep deep crater um Later on, when you see it, um, so if you go to the next slide, please, Alistair. Um, if <clears throat> we look at Copernicus at full moon, uh, you actually see the, all the rays around, uh, which is something that you cannot see so well when, when the Terminator is nearby. So at full moon, you can actually see all the ejecta from that, that form when that crater um, was formed. Um, and this is how the moon will be looking at in uh, Saturday, April 16. Um, and the picture <clears throat> on your left is a picture of the crater taken by the Lunar Recognizers Orbiter satellite, which went around the moon and took a lot of pictures. Um, thank you, Alistair. Uh, any questions? Well, we can have questions at the end. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? So up to now, we have never talked about observing the sun in this uh, uh, introduction to the universe, um, because actually observing the sun, it can be dangerous if you don't do it the right way. But the Explore the Universe certificate has a section about observing sunspots. So it says in there, uh, you could observe sunspots and then you can check it off, um, but it says warning, use properly filtered telescopes or binoculars. And that's very important because you should never look at the sun directly, especially with binoculars or telescopes because it could really hurt your eyes. So, so you never look at the sun without a proper solar filter. Uh, if you wanna look at it by eye, you need to use eclipse aids like the ones pictured in here, they are different brands. Uh, they are just all certified and safe for solar observing or you can use number 14 welder's glass and not any welder glass below that. It has to be number 14. Uh, that's the one that uh, it will be appropriate to look at the sun. Um, and so if the sun spots are big enough, like uh, these days we are having actually quite big sun spots. Uh, if you look at the sun with your eyes, uh, you may be able to actually see them on the surface. Um, but the best is actually to look at the sun with a telescope. And again, you have to put a solar filter like the one in the picture in front of the telescope. Um, they are uh, here in Canada. There is a company called Kendrick that makes very good solar filters, uh, safe and good to use. And you can buy it, you can buy them directly from them at Kendrick Astro or here in Edmonton, All Star Telescope. The, the store name All Star Telescope does sell Kendrick Astro um, solar filters. And they have solar filters for telescopes and they have solar filters for binoculars. 
So you have to buy them. They are not cheap. They are maybe around one hundred dollars, or maybe maybe a little bit cheaper for the binoculars. But normally the telescope ones range around one hundred dollars. But um, I personally enjoyed looking at the sun very much, and I think it's really a good uh, investment. Nevertheless, I wanted to point out that the University of Alberta Observatory is open for public for solar is open for the public to come and do solar observing on Wednesdays from 12.30 to 1.30. So we were out today already. Then next Wednesday, we will be there. Then we, so this Wednesday, April 6th is gonna be our last Wednesday. And then we are gonna close for a couple of weeks during the exam period. And then we will open again in middle of April. And I don't know if it's gonna be on Wednesdays or on Thursdays, but we will have weekly solar observing so just keep our keep checking our webpage or our social media, Instagram or uh, Facebook, and we will put in there what are the days. Uh, at this observatory, we have a telescope with a solar filter, and then we have a, an extra and special telescope named H Alpha that is also um, dedicated to look at the sun. Um, uh, can you please go to the next slide? Um, the sun uh, follows an 11 year cycle uh, where <clears throat> the magnetic field goes from very quiet to very uh, active and disturbed. And uh, when, when, when it is at the maximum and when the magnetic field is having a lot of kinks and quarks, um, it creates sunspots in the sun, <coughs> like the ones that you can see in this image. So this will be an image of the sun, that's how you will, how the sun will look at if you were looking at it with a telescope and a sun, a sun, a solar filter. Um, sun spots change all the time. So obviously they were not, they will not look exactly the same as in this picture. They appear, disappear, move, grow, change. Um, but they are really a lot of fun to, to look at because they have a lot of structure and they are always changing. Mm -hmm. Now we are getting into an active time so the last two years have been very boring and there were almost no sun spots in the sun. But for the last six months to a year, uh, the sun is finally picking up speed and is making more and more sun spots. And so now it's actually a lot of fun to look at it every day because it looks different. Um, and yes, there are a lot of features to be seen at the sun's photosphere. Um, so I hope that if you don't feel like looking at the sun on your own because it is dangerous and you don't want to invest in a solar in a solar filter, um, what you can do is come to the University of Alberta uh, solar observing sessions. We are open to the public, or eventually when the RASC uh, Observatory at the Telus Wall of Science opens, which I guess I don't know if it will be this summer or in September, they also have solar observing sessions in there. So that's the two places that I know in Edmonton where you could go and look at the sun with proper filter telescopes. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. Uh, yeah. So, so that's our little note about the sun. Uh, so now if we continue along in the... Yes, no, 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 that's okay. good. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, if we continue along in the Explore the Universe certificate, the next uh, section is about deep sky objects. That's a category that involve, uh, compromises a lot of different uh, objects that one can see in the sky. And every month we highlight two of them, uh, the ones that correspond that are nicely visible due south at that time. So this month, uh, for the month of April, um, a uh, something that is really nice is the Beehive Star Cluster called also Messier 2044 uh, in Cancer. Now, Cancer is a constellation that is actually, it has very faint stars. So it's very hard to see in, in the city. So you, you, you basically between Orion and um, Leo, there is an empty space. If you remember the chart that Alistair has shown us at the beginning, we had Orion and we have um, Leo with the star Regulus. And then there was an empty space in the middle. That's actually where Cancer lies. 
uh, but cancer is, has very faint stars. So you can see them with binoculars, but you cannot see them by eye um, in the city. So, but it has this very beautiful star cluster in the center of it, and it's actually really big. So it looks much better with binoculars than with telescope, because with the telescope, we, it very rarely you can get the whole cluster in the view of the telescope. So it's a beautiful uh, uh, swarm of, of stars. And um, actually, I remember the first time that I saw it, it was a very bad seeing night. So the stars were twinkling a lot. And then it really looked like a bee swarm. It, it really, I, I understood exactly why it's called a beehive because, because all the stars, it's like a ball of twinkling stars. And it was, it really looked like a, like bees just fussing around. So with a magnitude of 0, 3.1, it's, it's bright enough to be easily seen with the unaided eye from a dark sky. Um, I don't personally don't observe that much from dark skies. I observe more from the city. So I always need to use my binoculars to see it. I cannot see it from the city, but I'm sure Alistair will tell us if that's the case that you can actually see it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's known since classical times. It's uh, around 600 light years away. So it is actually one of the nearest open clusters to air. And just a little fun note, exoplanets have been discovered in stars belonging to this planet, to this cluster. So I don't know if you know, exoplanets are planets that are not within our solar system. So it's known that some of the stars that you can see in this cluster actually have planets orbiting them. Um, now, can you please go to the next slide? And to locate it, as I said, you have to go and scan an imaginary line from Regulus in Leo to Pollux in Gemini. So Regulus and Pollux are the stars that you can see from the city. Castor and Pollux are it's relatively easy to find because they're always together. And Regulus is, uh, uh, so they, they are equally bright and they are kind of in a line. Um, so those are, and they are just a little bit above Orion, which will be on the right of this picture. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you go between Orion and Leo, you're gonna go across uh, the constellation Cancer, which is like this inverted Y. Uh, but again, because the stars are not very bright, you really cannot see it by eye. And the beehive cluster is, is just there in the middle. And it's actually, surrounded by two bright stars, which were shown in the previous image. So if you look at it with binoculars, you actually can see the stars around too. So it's, it's kind of easy to find um, with, with binoculars. Um, and so to locate it, try the scanning. Um, yeah, so, so that's, we, we talk about it. Um, so can you please go ahead, Alistair? Thank you. <clears throat> and then another, Another um, object that can be seen uh, in the sky in April, it's an uh, open cluster too, another cluster of another group of stars called M35. Um, this one, uh, it's on the right of Gemini, whereas the beehive cluster was on the left. Uh, it was kind of where Alistair is pointing at now. Uh, M35 is on the other side of, <coughs> of Gemini. And um, this cluster appears best under dark skies, but it can be seen fairly well with 10 times 50 binoculars from a suburban location. So I can, I can see it from the city with uh, my binoculars. It's of course a much better view with a telescope, but, uh, but you can see it. Um, and it's also, if you find Orion, you can just also go a little bit high and then you will, you will find the, the stars that make the fit of, um, of Gemini. And then from there, you can scan to M35. It's around 2,970 light like, years away from us. And um, if you go to the next slide, these are some wonderful pictures collected by Alistair. Um, this is uh, fatal juice at the bottom here from Orion. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, that's 
blue wonderful. one up here is Castor Pollux is just off the screen. And mm -hmm. these are the uh, orangey feet of uh, Gemini. And it's just right yeah. off the edge. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, and the next image is a close up um, of the cluster. If you look at it from the city with binoculars, it won't look like that. But uh, um, yeah. OK, mm -hmm. so I think that's all for me today. Thank you, Berta. Yeah. OK, uh, we're going to um, shift to uh, talking a little bit about the tilted sky. Um, or depending on how you look at it, the tilted planet that we live on. And uh, so here's a diagram from Di Otwell's Astronomical Companion. It's, it's a, a, a very oversized book, so these diagrams are actually quite big. Um, and uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, this is one of the uh, older editions, so it's a, a hand-drawn one. But uh, nonetheless, um, here we are uh, anchored to our a planet, and the sun in this case is off to the lower left, illuminating that. So this would be um, uh, closer to uh, uh, winter time. So the North Pole is in darkness. And uh, here we are, you can see there's a little stick figure lying on the ground, their back, uh, knees up, uh, feet flat on the, on the ground, and with their back lying down. So from um, a human perspective up is this way, and from a planet perspective up is towards the top of the page here. But um, uh, it, for, from our perspective, it looks like uh, the, the sky, the top of the sky is up here, and then Polaris essentially is uh, straight, is where our um, North Pole points to. And so the sky appears to spin around uh, uh, Polaris, but it's really, of course, the Earth rotating uh, all of us uh, all the way around the sky. So if uh, it might be a little hard to imagine, but imagine this, um, this dome here, um, and the whole thing whirls from sort of sideways to face on to around uh, the back. Uh, around again. Um, and so from our perspective, we tend to see the sky uh, with up and down, that's sort of these lines, and then different altitudes are these lines here. And then to give you a, a different uh, perspective of it all, um, the, uh, there's Polaris up here in the sky appears to rotate around Polaris as, uh, as the Earth whirls around. And so here we are uh, sitting up. This is one of the newer um, diagrams uh, from uh, the book, a little uh, cleaner than uh, that uh, previous one. Uh, but again, from our uh, perspective, where up is straight above our head, um, Polaris is tilted uh, way off uh, to the north, about halfway up the sky. And Orion seems to rise in the east, come around, and it will set in the west. And I'll bump back to this uh, diagram um, in a little bit. Um, but uh, oh, the other thing to point out is this southern area is we can never see the stars in the far southern sky uh, because the earth is in the way and the we can only see down into the south as far as uh, we are uh, tilted. So let me jump to this book. Um, this guy. So if you reset the, the tilt to what it seems to us when we're just sitting normally and up is up. Um, so Polaris again is uh, off uh, to the north and the whole sky swings around uh, Polaris. And so the stars in the east appear to rise uh, at a nice 
so a 45 degree angle or so, swoop to the south and then swirl around and set uh, in the west. And uh, one of the things to um, point out here, uh, well, here's the celestial equator. So if you take the Earth's equator and sort of stretch it out into the sky, uh, this is um, the, what it would look like. And Orion is straight smack on the celestial equator. But the other thing uh, to notice here is uh, the ecliptic. And that's the um, essentially the flat plane that our solar system rides on. So all of the planets are almost in a flat uh, disk uh, going around the sun. But that's tilted as well with respect to our tilt, which goes to Polaris. So in some cases, the uh, ecliptic is well below the equator, which it will be uh, in summer. And so when planets are on um, down in sort of Sagittarius, they're going to be low in the sky, whereas uh, up uh, farther north through Gemini uh, and uh, Taurus above Orion here, uh, they will rise really high in the sky. So uh, in about um, six years or so, Jupiter will be a great winter object. Uh, but it's uh, now um, merging into the fall, where it's just going to be uh, not too far from the equator and uh, just about halfway up the sky. So um, hopefully this diagram will help uh, a little bit better. Um, as uh, So this is now the, the plane of the solar system, uh, where uh, the planets uh, all go around on this. Sort of, so you're looking sort of slant-wise down onto, imagine, a table. And you'll notice here that um, the Earth's uh, tilt is always the same in each one. Um, it's tilted uh, towards um, the, the distance uh, of the page here. Oh, it's tilted away from us. That's why so we can see more of it here and uh, less of it here. But in, um, in winter, our North Pole is tilted away from the sun. And so it's in darkness. And in summer, the tilt is towards the sun, but the tilt never actually changes. It's always pointing to the same place in the sky, sort of diagonally uh, off uh, to the distance. It's just what, uh, with respect to the sun, if we're on this side of the sun, where it's pointed towards it, and if we're on the other side of the sun, it's pointed away from it. And so that's why um, here, when we get nighttime, and Sagittarius in summer, since we're tilted away from this part of the sky, this part of the sky is, is quite low, which is where Jupiter and Saturn were last summer. And in winter, the tilt of the planet is towards uh, the, uh, the constellations of uh, Gemini, Taurus, and behind here. And so that's why they ride very high in the sky in our winter and very low in the sky in summer. So hopefully that makes uh, a bit more uh, sense. It's uh, one of the things that I hope to do in, the, in the, uh, when we get to being live in person in Planetarium, to do this with uh, three-dimensional props. Uh, it uh, tends to uh, look a little bit uh, uh, more obvious as to why uh, these things are tilted. I'll just uh, back up. Um, and so uh, that's why we get um, the planets high in the sky in winter and then very low in the sky in summer. And yeah, so in summer, the, the planets are all down here. So relative to the guy sitting down, it's just a very shallow angle to our horizon. Uh, but in, when the winter uh, sky is up there, it's very high in the sky as this part rotates around and is up here. So it's very high in the sky. So hopefully that makes uh, a little bit of sense. And um, we can uh, uh, sort of stop there and head to uh, questions. And I'll bring up the, uh, the gallery here. 
So everyone, you can ask questions, and if you, or if you feel you can ask the questions in the chat. Uh, either way, you can switch on your microphone or you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, Ed, do you have a question? I have a comment. Uh, when you were talking about using the welder's lenses for looking at the sun, if you have a problem finding a number 14 lens, which I think you might have, you can use lenses of lower numbers and just no. add them. No. Add them, no. add them together. Uh, you can use like I, sevens. I don't know. And um, I will hesitate to recommend anything like that um, because, uh, you know, you can really hurt your eyes and it, it cannot be like sometimes you're hurting your eyes and you don't even notice and it won't happen right away. So, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about welder grass. I've never tried to stack them together. I, I don't know the answer to that. So what I can tell you is that you have to use welder 14 or more, or if you don't have problem finding, I don't know. We do have them at the observatory in, in the university. We do have welder glass with a so I don't know where they call it, but we, you can, we can use it to look at the sun like that. But oh, otherwise, sure. otherwise I would recommend just going to a all star telescope and buying the glasses that I had in the picture because it cost $9. Yeah, just um, the, the, the little ones, yeah, are just a handful yeah, of dollars. Yeah, and, so if you, know, if you, if you cannot safe. find, yeah, if you cannot find the, the welder glass, and I don't know about that, I've never tried to do it myself, just go to all star telescope here in Edmonton or online. And then the glasses, I just checked them yesterday, they cost $10. And they are just little paper glasses, that, but they, they are safe and they are good to look at the sun and they are certified and you can use that. So you don't need the welder glass. You can just buy those glasses. Um, will that yeah. answer your question, Ed? Otherwise I cannot answer if you can put two together because I should uh, say no in principle. I wasn't asking the question, I was telling you. <laughs> And you were telling me, yes, okay, thank you. Have you. some welding uh, experience then. Yes, yes, I, I, I certainly, I guess legally speaking, I cannot say yes okay. to that, but uh, yeah. And just, just to add to that, uh, like I've done it, tape them together so that if you set them down on a table, you don't accidentally pick up just the top lens and look through it. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, in the yes. chat, uh, there is um, the sun viewing at the U of A and the other location is the TELUS World of Science uh, Observatory. And hopefully that will be open this summer. And uh, uh, Jeff here, who uh, is one of the frequent uh, uh, people who uh, hosts uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the observatory there. And I did mean to say, uh, <laughs> it slipped my mind earlier that, um, uh, next week, uh, Jeff is uh, doing his What's Up in the Sky this month, and among other things, we'll be talking about Mercury, and Mercury is making a really good um, uh, apparition, as it's called, in the uh, evening sky uh, for uh, the, uh, especially the second, well, second two-thirds of April, uh, from the 10th to the 30th, so uh, Jeff will be uh, um, talking about that. Uh, there was another question earlier about what causes the rays around Copernicus. So, Berta, while you um, talk about that, I'll bring up the uh, <laughs> I, image of Copernicus again. Yeah. What causes the rays around Copernicus? I don't even understand, to be honest with you. I don't know what the question means, but I guess you are understanding it, so maybe you explain it to us. Um, oh, the rays around Copernicus, sorry. So, somehow I didn't, oh, the, the, yes. Copernicus, the, the crater. Uh, sorry, yes, I didn't explain it properly. I meant to say, so, so craters in the moon are created when big objects like asteroids or something actually impact in the moon. That uh, four billion years ago, between four and two billion years ago, it was happening more often. There were a lot of objects when the solar system was forming, uh, passing by and the moon uh, was getting a lot of impacts. And so uh, some of the biggest craters like Copernicus up there or Tycho down there, uh, the ones that Alistair is pointing at, um, uh, 
they they were created by big objects that impacted on them. And so when that impacted, that basically created a lot of ejecta coming out of the crater, coming out of the surface of the moon, let's say. It's like, you know, they always do this experiment for kids where you have a bucket of sand and you throw a ball into that bucket of sand. And then that kind of creates a crater. Like that, that's how the craters of the moon, if you, if you can imagine, form is that you had uh, high speed uh, asteroids impacting on the surface of the moon. And when they were big enough, all the ejecta basically will create those rays uh, as it kind of move and spread around. And so Copernicus has uh, raised the, the, as the crater be, below it to the, to the left also has it. And I forgot the name of that crater, uh, at least Kepler. And then Tycho, the one down there, um, at the bottom of the moon has the biggest ejecta ray rays uh, that also make it all the way almost to the top of the moon. And these rays are more visible during, during full moon. So, so the best time to see them is during full moon. So you won't see them so clearly as the moon uh, is getting, uh, is waxing, but you will see it uh, in full moon. I and hope that answers your question, Jane. And, and uh, another reason that, um, like the, the follow-up question might be, well, if there's uh, thousands of craters, how come we don't see thousands of rays? And um, well, the, the big one is big. Uh, the bigger the uh, impact, the more it, uh, stuff that it excavates out and throws out. But the other key thing that uh, has uh, been uh, figured out is that um, as um, the surface of the moon is exposed to the sun constantly, and so the, the soil actually gets bit by bit darker and darker as the eighth of millennia and millions of years pass, um, it, it slowly gets darker. And so uh, there will be older rays on the surface of the moon, but they, uh, because they've darkened over time, we just don't see them with the contrast that uh, a fresh crater um, uh, jump exhuming, I guess, is <laughs> uh, blasting out uh, fresh soil from uh, just underneath. Uh, that soil will be of uh, a lighter color um, in, until uh, another few millions of years go by and it too will slowly fade as, as the solar particles uh, uh, bombard the soil. There's another one up here. And oh, actually. Can I add something, Alistair? You certainly can. Okay. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the craters with the uh, prominent rays like Copernicus and Tycho and Kepler are fairly young. Uh, when I say fairly young, it's like maybe 100 million years old, um, which is uh, why we see them, because uh, they haven't had a chance to erode in the sunlight and micrometeorite impacts to uh, make them fade. And, and also they're visible at... Uh, full moon most prominently because the um, characteristic of you know stuff on the moon is that it reflects light back in the direction it came like a traffic sign mm. uh, like if you look at the day night the moon is full and then you look at it the night before or the night after you'll notice the night is full the moon is considerably brighter uh, because the light is reflecting back in the direction it came again, like, like a traffic sign. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, thank you, Jeff, that's uh, an important point. Uh, for example, here is the crater Tycho with its you know, only half of its ray system. You can still see the one out there that, and, and the ray here, but the, the rays in here are, are effectively you know, not visible, but at full moon, poof, they're a lot more prominent. Yeah, I hope that answered the question. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, 
And the tidbit for uh, um, the end of the month uh, for the next presentation um, I'll be doing, um, it's April 23rd, um, um, I'll be talking about a comet that is uh, coming by the uh, solar system that hopefully will be as nice as Comet Neowise was a couple of years ago, if we're lucky. I'll talk about that uh, next month. And uh, if there is, if Linda, or oh, there is another question. Uh, is mineral content content different on different parts of the moon? Uh, <laughs> good question. Okay, I'm not a moon geologist. <laughs> Maybe Alistair knows the answer to that. I know there is a little bit, but I honestly don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure Jeff actually knows more moon geology than I do, but yeah. Yeah, the, the short answer is, oh yes. <laughs> It's very different in different parts. But go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say it, it uh, from the samples that have been returned from the six Apollo missions plus the uh, unmanned uh, sample return missions. Uh, yeah, the, the moon's geology is is quite a bit different uh, in various parts of the moon. Um, uh, Apollo 11, because that's the one everybody remembers. Um, they found the moon there was uh, uh, about three three billion years old, uh, and the uh, the regolith in the Sea of Tranquility, that, which they picked because it was fairly flat, it was an easy place to land, the safest place to land, uh, was quite a bit different than what they found at the next mission, Apollo twelve, which also landed in Amaria but at a different one in the Sea of Storms. You know, a a every place they went to was was different. Uh, there was a big surprise uh, for the Apollo 16 mission, which oh, I'll give it away. That's one of my history things I'm going to do next week. Um, uh, they expected to find a lot of evidence of volcanic activity there, and uh, they didn't find anything. They found something completely different. So, oh, and I should also also mention because I was out because it was such a nice day and it was sunny and it wasn't raining and snowing, and I. I slapped a filter on one of my scopes and had a look at the sun there. and there's a lot of sunspots on there right now. So, so if you do have a solar filter and a solar telescope, um, have a boo. It's, it's mm -hmm. quite active after years of just staring at a billiard ball. <laughs> yeah, I look at it today. The sunspots are huge and everywhere. It's just so pretty. Yeah. yeah. And I have an H8 alpha scope as well. Uh, and, uh, there was quite a lot of action going on also. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so it's interesting that at the observatory in the university, we have so many people for evening and so few people for solar. Somehow people don't understand, you know, the solar observing who cares about the sun, I guess, but it's actually a lot of fun to look at it. And for those of us who just started looking at the sun because sometimes it's just during the day and it's warm and you just want to go out, the more you look at it, the more hook, uh, at least for me, I, I, the more I look at it, the more I like it. So. And, and uh, as you had mentioned to re, um, re emphasize the point that um, in the course of one hour, and that's a nice thing about volunteering at the, uh, at the observatories, you get to stay there for a period of three hours or something like that. And you can actually see structures change shape slightly, not, hugely, uh, but uh, you, you see, uh, you can actually see sunspots splitting uh, over the course of uh, three hours and getting lighter mm -hmm. or darker. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. Uh, if the yeah. universe is, is, is expanding, how come we are not getting bombarded by things like before? Um, and uh, that, that's a really good question um, because uh, at, uh, at one point it's like, well, where are all the craters on the earth? And the, the, basically, they got buried by um, the moving Earth, the plates shifting, um, and, and the Earth churning itself uh, that way. The weather uh, actually erodes things. There are some neat uh, craters that are uh, still exist. Our uh, observer's handbook actually has a spot for that. The, the main reason um, that um, we don't get bombarded now 
is that um, uh, we're, we're sort of, we, we finished sweeping up and, and that's essentially how uh, planets are thought to build. There's a lot of uh, pebbles, dust, and then the pebbles collide into rocks, the rocks collide into boulders um, in, and into bigger things. But um, the biggest chunks end up sweeping as they go around. Uh, things collide and we, uh, bit by bit, we slowly clear out um, our orbit to the point where there's very little um, in our neck of the woods. Um, however, there's still a lot of uh, stuff out there. Uh, we know where the biggest things are, but uh, where was it? 1995 was when a comet slammed into Jupiter and created these uh, uh, very cool uh, black splotches that we were able to see with our amateur telescopes here. Um, and uh, David Levy, uh, who uh, uh, was one of the co-discoverers of uh, that comet, uh, sort of put out a notice, you know, um, it's solar system still under construction. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's still lots of stuff out there orbiting. Um, and the, the, the asteroid belt, as much as it is not like the Hollywood, uh, uh, just rocks everywhere, it's, there are a lot of rocks, but there's a lot of space in between them. And, uh, and so a few of them do come by the Earth uh, now and then, and uh, we get buzzed by them. Um, the smallest ones, of course, we pick up uh, as uh, they, they burn up in the upper atmosphere like um, as meteors. Um, but uh, so what ends up happening is that the biggest ones have been essentially eaten and have already collided with us or the moon um, and or Mars. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, as you get to smaller and smaller chunks, there's more and more of them, um, but there's they're less harmful, thankfully. Uh, so uh, yeah, the inner solar system is relatively free of big chunks, but there's uh, a lot more chunks in the uh, outer solar system. Yeah, so I, I just to, to add to that, uh, thank you, Alistair. So yes, basically what I was explaining when we were talking about the moon is that the solar system 4 billion, 3 billion years ago was still in formation. And like Alistair said, the way it starts form is that there is this big gas cloud and then the stars, the sun starts forming in the center and then all these chunks are spread around in a disk. And then as they eventually coalesce in planets like Alex has been explaining. And so then these planets, the big chunks start getting all the little chunks, but that's, that's the past of our solar system to some extent. And now our solar system is more mature and uh, as for the universe expanding, um, I don't know why would you think that the universe expanding will mean more things hitting us because what's happening is actually things are spreading. Like the solar system per se doesn't feel the expansion. The solar system stays, you know, together. Um, obviously the space is expanding, but we are together. And so when you talk about the expansion of the universe, uh, things are actually in the big picture getting farther and farther away from us. Um, not the things nearby, but, the, but the, the universe as it's expanding is actually having more and more empty space in between this galax the, the galaxy clusters and the super galaxy clusters and things like that. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Here, if I can get it just right from our observer's handbook. Um, this shows the impact craters in North America. Let's see if I can get that above there. So there's, there's quite a handful of them. There's, uh, uh, well, 61 that are listed uh, in, in our handbook. And, and of course, the, the best known one is down in Arizona, Meteor Crater. But uh, we actually have, uh, as you saw from the diagram, there's a, a handful uh, in Alberta, although they can be uh, tricky to identify, but or find, but um, it, because they're so eroded by um, well, plants, trees, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, uh, for example, the white court meteor uh, was, is basically under a foot of soil. Uh, there's still a depression in the ground, but 
the uh, if they to get to the bottom of the crater, they have to essentially get almost a foot of soil uh, has grown in the sort of the, the ten thousand years that uh, that has happened since the uh, impact at uh, White Court. Um, so but, thank you, Alistair. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, but on the moon, there's nothing to erode the craters that much, except for the tiny micrometeorites. Uh, so uh, that they they look, uh, a, as Jeff said, a fresh crater is uh, a few million years old. So we are starting now, the questions that Linda is posting are starting more into the cosmology. Um, does everything span at the same rate? No, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. I don't know if you knew that, but it was discovered 1990 something by looking mm -hmm. at the uh, supernova type A stars, that the universe is expanding faster and faster uh, with time. And so and that is understood, is thought to be because of dark. So the, the postulation right now in physics is that there is such thing as called dark energy. And dark energy has anti-gravity. It's like all the things that have mass have gravity that pulls them together. Um, so gravity, if you think of the electric force, it has a positive charge and a negative charge. You have the electron and the positron, right? And there are different charges and one attracts and the other one repels. Uh, up to recently, gravity was thought to only have one kind of charge, which is the mass that basically attracts. Uh, but when it was discovered in the universe, it actually expands in an accelerated manner. So it's actually expanding faster as faster with time. Um, then it was postulated that we have something called dark energy everywhere in the universe. And it's something that it doesn't have mass because if it had mass, it will attract. So it's, it's an anti-mass, it's a pressure, it's a pressure that is pushing it away. And so that's, that's what dark energy is. And yes, um, the, and everything in the universe is isotropic. So everywhere that you look, it expands the same, but faster. So you, there is nowhere in the universe, as that's one of the principles of physics, that there is the isotropy of the universe, everything is the same um, everywhere you look but it's expanding at an accelerated rate. Uh, I hope that um, answers your question, but that's getting a little bit into cosmology. I'm trying to think if there is any book that explains this nicely, um, I, um, but it, nothing comes to mind right now. Um, there are a lot of uh, um, modern books about uh, cosmology for, for the general public. I'm trying to think of one and it just doesn't ring my head right now. Uh, but if you look into that, you will uh, understand a little bit more of the current theory of the, the current understanding of uh, the cosmology right now is that we have dark energy. That is something that makes the universe expand. And, now. and it's actually a, a very sort of exciting time in physics because uh, just about, um, well, 50 years ago, it was, well, we've pretty much solved everything in physics. It's just a matter of details now. Um, and then along came um, the, the recognition that, uh, well, it, based on our current understanding, there has to be this dark energy, but um, it's, what is it? Where does it come from? How does it work? It, it's the, we don't know. And so that, it, that, that turns out to be, well, that's exciting because when we do figure this out, we're going to well, change our, uh, our perspective, the way we uh, look at the universe. So, uh, and, the, and likewise with dark matter, it's, we, we know it feels gravity, but things seem to be able to pass through it. And so what is it? And it's, it seems to be uh, not the, electrons and protons and neutrons that make us up it's something else and so it's like what is it we don't know so it, it's uh, yeah to, so we're pretty sure we're going to uh, learn something interesting and if yeah. um and at the same time if you sort of flip the problem on the head it's just like well what if dark energy and dark matter is um like it's from our observations, we're deducing it, and from our theories uh, that hold everything together, we, we deduce that that stuff exists. But if we eventually find that that doesn't exist, well, that means our theories and deductions are wrong, and that too will 
be sort of exciting when we finally mm -hmm. sort of crack that open and go, oh boy, we how did we miss that? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a pretty yeah. exciting time. Uh, Linda asks, uh, yeah, it's complicated. There is another galaxy. Yes, the Andromeda galaxy is heading towards us. So, so that's what I was saying. When we talk about the expansion of the universe, we talk about it in the big picture as in cluster of, you know, a cluster of galaxies, our local galaxy cluster is, is together the same, the, the same way the solar system to some extent, the solar system stays together. You know, it's not that the earth is moving away from the sun. Um, I mean, the, the space between us is, 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 but we stay together. The, the local cluster of galaxies stay together and they have their own dynamics and they move around. And, and so, yes, we have galaxies that are heading towards us. So what you asked were two different questions. Why we don't get bombarded by asteroids? The answer to that is because the solar system is more mature now and we don't have as many rocks around anymore. Now, another galaxy colliding towards us, yes, that happens because in our local group of galaxies, the galaxies still move relative to each other. But the space between the cluster of galaxies and the superclusters is the space that is actually see the expansion in the big picture. Um, so so it's, I know it's complicated, but uh, this, the universe is so big that it makes sense to think of the solar system as a unit of our galaxy cluster as a unit, as a super cluster uh, so together, and then the space in between is what is expanding, basically. Um, I, if, yeah, even though basically the space in between us is, is expanding too, but that's getting into the tricky details, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I, I encourage you to, I, I, I will try to think of a good book to read uh, with for the general public that explains this cosmology aspects of, oh, look, uh, Ge Jeff is pointing out uh, the Na Neil Grice Tyson, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. So maybe that, I haven't read that book, uh, but he, he points it out, it's probably a very good one that explains this. I know it's a modern book because this is all modern theory. So if you pick up an old book by Stephen Hawking, maybe it may not have it uh, because the expansion of the accelerated expansion of the universe is actually as of 15, 20 years, 15 years, or I don't know, something like that. Um, so you have to pick a book that is relatively modern and it will explain it to you. And thank you, Jeff, that's a good recommendation. Um, yeah, yeah, it's an easy book. You know, it won't answer every question, but it gives you a bit of a background. And it's a lot easier to read than the book that every science geek had but didn't understand, uh, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think everybody had that book, but you read it and you go, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> or and anyway, what else? <laughs> well, yeah, or it, try it, to, or whatever. It, it, but, it was but cited that, that, as the, the most popular yeah. book that no one has read. <laughs> it's, um, that would be an old book to read, though. It won't have the expansion of the universe in there, right? Yeah, uh, because right. when I studied in university, we didn't know that. So we, we were still discussing if the universe was flat or not, right? Like, it's, it's just, yeah, things change. Um, um, the object recently launched to knock an object in a space is how calm I thought about it. I don't know. Yeah, the, I, I think that, uh, are you referring to the um, a sort of asteroid defense um, projects? Um, not sure if that's, because we, we've, we've done, there, there's, well, there, there's a uh, uh, movie, Hollywood movies about that kind of thing that uh, usually uh, um, uh, corrupt all sorts of laws of physics. Uh, but um, the, uh, it, it's, uh, there, there are plans to, if there's an asteroid that we discover that's uh, sort of on a collision course, the idea is to send up a rocket and to try and nudge it out of orbit. Um, the, uh, um, I'm not sure if that's uh, where you're, you're going with that, but uh, th that takes uh, uh, a lot more effort than Hollywood uh, uh, likes to show. It. It's uh, Hollywood likes to go, oh yeah, you just plant a few bombs and uh, away it goes. And it's just like, well, big rocks out there are really big and uh, <laughs> it takes a lot more than just a few bombs to do something to them. But uh, so the, the best path um, 
to uh, uh, prevent a, a, an asteroid from hitting the Earth would be to put some rockets on it and just slowly nudge it out of the way uh, rather than to actually destroy it. Yeah, there's a mission on the way right now. And uh, oh, okay. the idea is uh, it's going to hit later on this year. And oh, the others just scored again. Um, um, to def, you know, ch change its speed just like a fraction of a meter, which over time uh, will result in an object if it was on a collision course uh, to miss the Earth. You'd need plenty of warning. I mean, we're talking years ahead of time. You know, not like the ones in the movies where I'm oh or or don't look up, which which I thought was a really good movie. Uh, it's more about climate change than it was about a meteor. But anyway, uh, um, yeah, the idea is to uh, change its velocity very, very slightly, uh, a fraction of a meter is that over many, many months or years, it will miss the earth by, you know, a few thousand kilometers or whatever, but it, it's gonna hit this year. I mean, they, they've hit uh, a comet, uh, I can't remember what year it was. I know it hit. It's a while early. ago now. Um, yeah, it was in July. I remember we all went out uh, by Devon to see if we could see it. 20 years ago. Holy yeah, God. yeah. But that was more to see what's inside the comet rather than to try and change its correct uh, trajectory. Yeah, well, that one, I think it was a, was it 50 kilos or 100 kilo slug of copper? Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Um, and, and it, it's the sort of thing where um, the, the sizes just dwarf everything that make it very hard to grasp on a, uh, on a personal kind of level. Um, but, um, you know, it would be like throwing a rock at a concrete building and you sort of go, well, you know, you might get a little divot. And that's sort of what we've done so far. And uh, it's, uh, you know, to, to do more damage, you need a lot more speed and uh, speed is energy and, and that energy is fuel and it takes an awful lot of fuel to uh, accelerate something up to a fairly high speed. Uh, so the, uh, um, to, to uh, yeah, to try and, um, I mean, it, it's, um, well, even a small comet, um, it is uh, on the order of three or four kilometers across. Now, I mean, three or four kilometers doesn't sound too big, but if you imagine a snowball three kilometers across, you go, oh, that's actually pretty big. And, and, you know, how would you, you know, it, it's like if you used a tractor to push something three kilometers across, even if it's a snowball, you go, mm, that's not enough to do it. Um, but, um, and so the, uh, the, the uh, the best way as well is to just keep there and just <laughs> keep pushing very slowly and it'll just slowly shift. Because actually, um, well, a different uh, kind of topic, but it, it's still uh, uh, with uh, uh, comets is that uh, they outgas, like the tails come out of, uh, as jets and the jets actually act to change the course of the comet very slightly and uh, so that's one of the uh, big unknowns that uh, all these uh, you know something that's very slightly if you do that over 10,000 years 100,000 years it makes a big difference but the very slight in in the, in the short term doesn't do anything <laughs> So it sounds like these uh, uh, threatening objects, I guess you mean, are now the exception. Yes, they are. Uh, they are still, the, so the solar system was way more busy and way more active at the beginning. And now it's thankfully quiet. It doesn't mean that it's completely over. It's just that the frequency of these impacts or these threatening objects coming towards ours is smaller. But there is still, of course, a lot of effort and hopefully Hopefully that's not our main worry right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just give me a sec here. I'll share my screen again. Um, and uh, a neat place to go for these things is uh, spaceweather.com. 
Uh, they're talking, well, the headline is uh, uh, the new solar flare that will be throwing up aurora tonight, which we will not be able to see because of our local clouds. Uh, but uh, down at the bottom of the page, yeah, here's the aurora. Oh, shoot, be a good aurora. Anyways, um, but uh, down at the bottom of the page are the poten a list of potentially hazardous asteroids. So here you go, space rocks larger than 100 meters uh, that uh, come um, closer than about uh, 30 lunar distances. And uh, as, as Jeff explained, um, you know, to the Apollo rockets, like when you sort of see how much power those things had, it still took days to get to the moon. And so it's like space is huge, empty, big. And so when you say, oh yeah, it, uh, you know, th this rock is coming, oh, look at this, uh, half the lunar distance. Uh, so this is, oh, that was just a few days ago. It's already gone by. Um, but uh, that thing was only 16 meters in diameter. Uh, so uh, that, that would have been uh, uh, an amazingly big explosion. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, so here are the known ones. And every now and then um, we get uh, a fairly big one, like uh, here's a, a, an asteroid, like 1.1 um, kilometers across. So that would, uh, that would be uh, not civilization ending, but that would uh, definitely be city destroying. Um, and, uh, but thankfully that, that, that will get no closer than 10 times the distance to the moon. So um, on our side, is uh, basically that uh, space is mostly empty. So these uh, rocks that are uh, traveling all over the place, uh, it's really hard to hit anything um, because it's uh, space is so empty. But it, it's, a, it's a cool site. And, and of course, um, if you follow some of these links, it will uh, take you to uh, a NASA web page um, and uh, that, uh, that will have uh, something more on um, these uh, potentially hazardous asteroids. Thank you, Alistair. I didn't know that. <laughs> I just don't want to start obsessing now with that web page, though. <laughs> we we have enough crisis in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, let's uh, let's let's not yes. get slapped by an asteroid. Yes, yes. Just enjoy them going by. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, with that, uh, I'd like to wish everyone uh, a pleasant evening, rest of the evening, and uh, hopefully clear sky in a couple of nights or three or four or five. And, and get out there and have a look. And remember, one week from tonight, uh, Jeff is doing What's Up in the Sky for April, along with a little bit of Apollo 16 space history 50 years ago. <laughs> It's amazing. They actually were walking on the moon 50 years ago. Hard to believe. Okay. okay. Looking forward to hearing about that. Okay. Thanks. And okay. Good night, right. everyone. Thank you. Good Thanks, night. Alistair. Bye. Thanks, Berta. Bye. Thanks for the questions. <laughs>